This is a workshop about film finance, the most, uh, the most difficult thing to do in any film is always to find the money for the project. So sort of the reason for doing this workshop is because, you know, one, it's always a mystery on how to find money, and then two, most people don't really know how the business itself works, like how the actual nitty gritty of finding money for your film works, and what the details behind distribution and everything are. All right, so film, film finance. Um, so the big thing in film finance, first off, you sort of need to know is, you know, how does distribution work within the industry? Like, what does distribution mean? So many times you'll hear people say, I just want to get distribution for my film, but they don't actually know what that is. So you've got a variety of things. You have your studio films, you've got specialty studios, you've got uh, truly independent films, and um, VOD, digital, foreign sales as a component for distribution. Studio films, these are you know everything you guys see at the box office every weekend. The big premieres that are happening every single Friday. Joker this weekend, um, you know, the new Rambo movie, all those big films that are coming out, all the Marvel films that are, you know, huge screens, four thousand screens coming, you know, all over the country. And, and, and these come with huge budgets for print advertising, P and A. And so what's really important to understand this is to get something like this off the ground, a the p a spend for a wide release movie is at least $25 million. So you've got to think, even with your budget, if you're spending $25 million, that has to get recouped first. The only way you get that kind of size movie out is $25 million or more in advertising. Yeah, and so those, those are the big films that, you know, none of us are going to make on a... Uh, on, a, on, a, on, our, on ourselves. This is something, you know, Universal, Disney, or whatever, you're working on that big project. They own the whole thing completely, and it is, you know, those, those, that animal is, is what it is kind of thing. Um, you have your specialty studios, your uh, Fox Searchlight type of, uh, type of companies that are doing these moderate budgets, you know, five to $20 million, $30 million-ish, and these, these types of films don't exist much anymore. You know, a lot of these studios have either been bought up or they've uh, closed down or now, you know, when Disney has bought up Fox, they, Fox had Fox 2000 and Fox Searchlight, they basically shut, shut down Fox 2000 and still have Fox Searchlight. But these are a lot of times the prestige films that are your, you know, a, a Academy Award nominated type films and just fit in this small specialty range. They don't get the, the number of screens that the big ones get. They've got smaller marketing budgets. Um, you know, Weinstein Company used to be one of those, and everything they did, obviously, things have changed as, uh, as far as that goes. And, and I'm going to share that, you know, in that, in that space, here you get some pretty smart distribution professionals. They get very guerrilla like in their processes for distribution, you know, for marketing, advertising. They're not spending the same kind of budget as the studio films. They're actually, you know, they, they'll spend quite a bit, they'll still spend five, ten million dollars, but they'll spend it smarter using today with all the digital media uh, strategies, but also very much boots on the ground. I spoke to um, the, um, a buyer at uh, Sony, I forget what's, I think Sony Picture Classics, and um, they took, there was a movie that came out two years ago, or a year ago, called Searching, I don't know if many of you saw that. Yes. It, yep. Yeah, it was uh, produced for a million bucks, and they picked it up. And um, they did a boots on the ground strategy where they gave away tickets, you know, for, for the first few weekends and or for the first weekend in several select cities. They gave away tickets so people would talk and create a buzz. And then that continued to go on and do seventy five million dollars in the box office, you know, after the free weekend because of the buzz and the and everyone talking. And so they, that I thought when I spoke to that um, buyer, I thought that was very creative. I mean, it took a lot of guts to buy that film for how much they paid and. Um, it's a very, I was very impressed with their guerrilla tactics and their marketing strategy. And a lot of times what you see with films in this range is they're going to open first in 10 theaters, they see how it does in those 10 theaters, and then they go to 100 screens, they see how it does in those 100 screens, and if it's a, a film that generates buzz and continues to grow, then you know it could eventually reach out to those 1,000 screens or whatever, and could be one of those hits. Annapurna Films, um, uh, it's owned by Megan Ellison, who's the daughter of Larry Ellison, founder of Oracle. You know Her company has focused on a lot of these films, and they've actually had some struggles recently. They've, they've taken some swings at some, some films in this range and have completely missed on it. They've not done well. So this is a, this is a, a category of films that is 
constantly shrinking, basically. So it's it's very you know as we know it's a very tough business. Um, I, say, um, I just forgot. Keep going. Okay. Oh, um, <laughs> so then then your truly independent films, which a lot of people in this room I know have been in, involved in, and anything from the ultra micro budget fifty thousand dollar feature, you know, up to you know million dollar range are are just these really small. Films, you know, very often you're not going to get a theatrical release at all. It's going to be, you know, straight VOD play. You know, you have very little money for marketing. It's typically financed by friends and relatives, and just however you can scrape it together, Kickstarter or other platforms like that, or you're just able to find some investors who are interesting in putting, you know, putting money into films, and you're not going to get typically a wide. You know, sort of a wide distribution release. Yeah. I, I was just going back real quick to the special studios. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Box Office Mojo. You can actually go in and, and dig into the details and data and see how they released the movie, whether initially it was 10, 100, 200, how they expanded that. And then you can also see the timing of the uh, awards uh, nominations. As soon as you get the nomination, boxofficemojo.com, and uh, it gives you all kinds of data on films. Now, you know, what they did in sales and box office revenues by country, um, by the number of theaters, um, all kinds of data. So you can go in and research some, you know, some of the films. You know, many of us sometimes, uh, as we're creating content or developing content, we're trying to think of a model that someone else did. Or we're, I, mean, I, I research these things just to understand what other people are doing so I can get smarter about strategies and what, um, what's happening in the current marketplace. So Box Office Mojo has a wealth of data to research some of the strategies that some of these specialty guys uh, use. And so they're the ones, you know, I, I still remember um, Three Billboards. You know, that's a great, uh, um, that movie uh, is a great example. I, I analyzed their release structure. They had, um, what do they call it? I forget, someone had a nickname for, um, for that pr process, but you know, they had a release, and then as soon as it got nominated, then they went wider. And you could see that you know, initially it was maybe 100 theaters, and all of a sudden they went to 1,000 theaters after the nominations came out for the Oscars. Yeah, and a lot of times with these with these small films, you know, that even if it's, um, you know, let's say it's a half million dollar film or something like that, if you're lucky enough to get distribution where you do get some sort of small theatrical, it's guaranteed that you're going to lose money on the theatrical. But the reason, I'm being told to walk this way to be on camera better, uh, the reason that you'll do like a small theatrical for say a half million dollar film or something like that is because then once it goes to iTunes and some of the other VOD platforms, it gets ranked at the top. And so it pushes you up basically so that you're easier to find so that yeah. You know, when people are, are looking for stuff, because you know how it goes when you're going through Netflix or anything else, it's just film after film after film, and you kind of get, yeah. get lost in the... It'll say, the, the thing is, that it'll say playing in theaters now, and you can get an extra dollar per movie if it's playing in theaters or, you know, just releasing theaters, you know, it's just a, it's just a heading, it's a, it's a game, and I think the minimum is 25, I think? Yeah, something like 25 that. 25 theaters is the minimum to get the playing in theaters now that one dollar premium on that movie. Yeah. So so what's so what'll happen is you know your distributor puts the uh, puts the film out and it's playing in theaters and you're in those twenty five screens. They're not gonna put any marketing dollars behind it whatsoever because they just wanted to put it out, make sure it's in theaters so that off VOD they can get that extra dollar basically, but they're not gonna put any P and A spend behind it to boost it and boost those theatrical numbers because it doesn't matter. They know they're losing money on it, so why throw good money after bad and lose more money than you need to for something like that. Now I was also saying these truly independent films there's a wide range of reasons why these films get made. You know, money comes in for a wide range of motivations, and so sometimes, sometimes it is for business purposes. There's a business strategy behind it. Sometimes it's just ego. You know, to uh, some some people just consider it art. You know, I want to donate to the arts. Um, I always cringe at that. I'm like, no, I'm running a business here. And uh, <laughs> you know, but my investors still tell me that yeah, you know, it's just my artistic um, bucket, you know. And so, um, and then there's always passion projects. You know, people just want to see a film made, and so uh, it's uh, it's something that they've been driven to make, and so they just want to make it 
for whatever reasons um, that motivates them personally. And a lot of these end up being your film festival type films as well. You know, they go on the film festival circuit, they play the film festival circuit for uh, a year or two, and they're just kind of out there doing their thing. And it's great for the filmmaker because they can say, you know, I had this film playing this festival, this playing play this festival, and there may be no money ever behind it. The investors may never see their money back again. And that's something that, you know, as you as producers need to be honest with your investors as far as your distribution strategy and what the realistic expectations of, you know, of the film are, film are when it goes out there. Uh, well, you made reference to um, the theatrical release to get a higher ranking VOD. Do they just go to the theater chain, you know, like AMC, and buy out the theater for a weekend or for a week? No, it's not. It's not a four. Yeah, it's not a four. It's not a four walling type thing. It's usually done through a larger company, like let's say Lionsgate. I'll use uh, I'll use Burning the Dolphin as an example. Um, you know, film that we produced here locally. Santosh was uh, an investor in, and so for this film, uh, Lionsgate released the film. And so when you have a big company like Lionsgate, when they you know go to AMC or whoever it is, they're just telling them. This, this is going to be in your theater for a week because they're also releasing all these other big films. So when it's a big distribution company like that, that's you know that's one thing. If you're talking about a smaller film and you want to four wall it, in and does everybody know what four walling means? Four walling is just when you pay the theater. You're basically just renting the theater so that your film can play there, so that you can say it played theatrically. And there's actually a company called Four Walled which is really interesting. So this is a company based in LA, and they've got a partnership with the Lemley Theaters in Los Angeles, and what they'll do is you can pay a fee, let's say $900, and they're getting a bunch of other films to do that same thing, and they'll give you a slot on a Saturday. And so you can have your film play for an entire week for $900, and that's because they have you know eight other films that are also paying that, so they're cost averaging it out, but then they do a proper, you know, it's up to you to market it, but you can say, hey, my film is playing in theaters in Los Angeles or whatever, and you can use that as a, as a marketing tool yourself, which really it's down to the social media. And so if you have a distributor who's putting it out on VOD and you want to say playing in theaters now, that's really a negotiation with your distributor on how they would manage that and, and what the language is when it goes up on VOD. I don't know the behind-the-scenes details of that, but it'd be something to work directly with your distributor. And it's hard to know what they did exactly because um, these films, even when they do these limited releases of 25 theaters, there's no numbers released on them. So m many of these smaller releases don't get published in terms of box office numbers. Yeah, they're not gonna, they're not gonna report, you're not gonna be able to look on Box Office Mojo and see you know, what the theatrical numbers were for that particular film. It wasn't really the intent, it was just a, the theatrical release was just intended for that premium. Right. Yeah. So, and then, you know, the other, the other outlet outside of theatrical is everything that we see, you know, nowadays, uh, you know, a video on demand, you know, digital foreign sales, and we say VOD, it can be a variety of things. There's, uh, there's AVOD, TVOD, SVOD, um, there are all these different ways that it gets out there. So AVOD is, you know, advertising video on demand. You might be seeing lately that um, IMDB has their new IMDB thing where they have all these movies for free, but they play ads. Uh, Tubi is another another platform, and Tubi is doing really well in urban markets um, or uh, in demographically depressed areas where you know people can't necessarily afford to pay you know eight ninety nine or five ninety nine every time they want to watch a movie and they want to rent it on VOD or something like that. So you just you know watch the advertising. It's it's basically what TV was when we were all kids kind of thing. You just watch television and you watch the commercials, and they're doing the same thing, but it's like an on demand platform now. And then the subscription VOD, you know, your Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime and, and those sort of platforms. And what's really important about you know, everything we're talking about here with the distribution channels, it, it actually is really important from a financier's perspective to talk about this first. Uh, my film school professor said it the best. He said, your job as a producer is to make the shoe fit the, fit the foot. Okay, and so that means in, in my language, what I use in my typical as a financier, I would say, I want to know how I'm going to get out of trouble before I get into trouble, you know. And so, much like my golf game too, it's um, <laughs> trouble. But uh, um, it's um, it's all about knowing how you know. Once I know how my strategy for this particular concept or script of how I want to see it released in one of these four boxes, then everything from even within the script, you know, how contained is it going to be, how you know, action is it going to be, uh, all these things that affect my budget. I work backwards, and so that affects the way you approach cast, the way you approach you know every aspect, the the amount of extras, the number of um, scenes, and so on. So we always work backwards and make the shoe fit the foot. 
And then so sort of talking about that, uh, you know, home video, home video isn't what it used to be. You know, DVD doesn't really exist that much anymore, except for the big titles. I don't know how well you can read that, but you can see things like, you know, Avengers Endgame has still sold, you know, three million DVD Blu-ray units essentially for basically 67 and a half million dollars. So that's a nice little add-on on top of your box office and everything else they're doing. But again, but again, you look at this list, the top 46 on here, uh, anything all the way from Aqu uh, Aquaman and Avengers at the top, and it's all Marvel movies, Bohemian Rhapsody, Star Wars Born, all the way to the bottom, you know, Us and Pet Cemetery and A Dog's Way Home, Smallfoot. So something, if you look at this list, something that you're going to recognize is, uh, is, is two things. You're going to see family and kids movies, and you're going to see the big budget Hollywood films, essentially, all sprinkled through in there. I don't think I see a single independent, you know, specialty film or any of the small independent films that we were just talking about in your, in your top 46 on that list. Yeah, no, I see that. So, uh, so kind of a little breakdown to give you a little more understanding about about the films, we decided to use Black Panther as an example here. So Black Panther with a $200 million budget. And like Santos said, you know, typically a $25 million marketing spend, but for a film like Marvel, what they do, they spend the equivalent of their budget on their marketing budget as well. So you're talking about a $200 million marketing budget is equal to the budget of the film. And Black Panther did some really interesting things. And even these big studio films, you know, when they have all this money spent on TV advertising and stuff, they're still doing a lot of grassroots type of advertising. You know, Black Panther was very specific in reaching out to black churches and all sorts of different communities that they thought would be interested in seeing this film. It really drove huge, huge numbers of people to the theater um, for that. So you're talking about $400 million to put it out. And what well, one keep in mind also with that advertising that they spend, when they're spending that size of a budget, they also frequently own the channels yeah. and the distribution um, channels that they're advertising on. So they are spending a lot, but some of their risk is mitigated because they're just putting money from one pocket to the other pocket. Yeah. So, Disney marketing is saying, oh, hey, ABC, yeah. we're going to spend $20 million in advertising ABC and ESPN. ESPN yeah. and so, but we already own these. So you're basically giving money back to yourself from one you know, department within the company to another department within the company. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about a uh, $1.3 million box office. Um, and what people forget when they see the box office numbers, and they're like, wow, that made a, you know, $100 million in the box office. Well, the theater gets some of that money too. So the theater typically gets about, you know, we use 50% as an average. The theater gets 50% 50, 50 of that money. Wait, wait, wait. <clears throat> the, the typical split is, it's usually like the first, what, first week is like a 90 It's, it's tiered. The, the 50 yeah. comes in after it's been like five Yeah, but as, as an average. So I, I was thought that, you know, that in the, when you think about domestic, average 60-40, yeah. and 4 and 50-50. Um, but it, it varies, it's just, it's just the average, it's an averaging. So yeah. these are metrics just to use as a... Right, but that opening week where it's $100 million, Marvel's going to see... 90, yeah, they're going to see the... They're 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 see 90, 90, 90, 90, 90. Yes, they see the majority, but this is an average over the lifetime of the film, basically. And because if you look at China as well, China keeps 75% of anything. So if the film does $200 million in China, China's keeping 75%. They're only getting 25% back. So that's why, you know, we just use that 50-50 average. And, and China is a, I mean, it, they say by next year or two years from now, it's going to be bigger than the U.S. box office in terms of revenues. Yeah. So it's pretty, it's pretty significant. It's probably 75% equivalent of the U.S. box office for the big films today. So, and again, this, you know, these are just averages. You know, I didn't call up Disney and say, hey, can you give me your exact breakdown of, uh, of what your film is? Um, but, you know, after you start taking out all these costs, and your $400 million costs, you know, you do $1.3 billion and really have $274, $275 million in profit from box office. And then you've got distribution costs and profit participation fees and all this back end kind of stuff that comes out too. And again, some of that they end up paying back to themselves in distribution costs. But, you know, a lot of those fees that are going to your directors and your actors and everything else. Um, so, you know, the numbers don't end up being that huge. But, again, Disney being Disney, they own everything, you know, from the, from the toys to, you know, posters to the slippers that kids are buying or pajamas or whatever else it might be in there. And some of the data that I've seen is that what you make, so everything outside the box is, is, is both in their ancillary revenues, is that the ancillary revenues are typically equivalent 
to the box office revenues on these big films. So, and the margins there are a lot wider. And uh, you've already spent the P&A, so there's none of that recruitment. So this is just pure profit from the ancillary. So this is, you know, watching a movie on demand, selling rights to the airlines. When you, you know, many of you probably sure watch some of these movies when you fly a plane. Well, those airlines have paid for those rights. And hotels and all those other places where we go, people buy these rights. So these are all ancillary revenues that they get subsequent to this. Yeah, so the numbers are going to be obviously be way, way, way more higher, but I just wanted to kind of give a sample idea of what a sort of what a breakdown, you know, of, uh, of all of this is. And then, you know, uh, Netflix has had a lot of the a lot of the Disney, a lot of the Marvel films for a while, and so Netflix is paying a huge fee to have those films on there. But now those contracts are expiring, and Disney has its new uh, platform, Disney Plus, that's coming out. And so, you know, Disney's pulling back all of the Marvel movies, everything Disney owns, off of Netflix for their own platform. And so now, you know, they're going to have their own subscription VOD platform where they're going to be you know, making money off of that and all of their content, um, you know, coming up. And I think that's uh, about a month from now, November or, or something. So I wanted to kind of continue to break down um, sort of what the waterfall is and what this uh, what it looks like. Uh, and this is for an example of a thirty million dollar feature film grossing seventy five million worldwide. So if 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 you guys are not familiar with Stephen Follows, um, Stephen Follows uh, has an amazing amazing website where statistically he breaks down everything you could think of within the film industry to a granular level, an amazing amount of data that's really worth researching and taking a look at. Um, so, you know, again, take a, you can kind of take a look and you can see there with the theatrical, the home entertainment, the TV, the VOD, the other, which would be the ancillary that, uh, that uh, Santosh was talking about, um, you know, what your total received is, what your P&A costs, your distribution fees, the sales agent, you know, if somebody's selling the movies for you, you know, they've got to get paid, they've got marketing costs on top of it, your original budget. By the time you break down basically this $30 million film that did $75 million worldwide, the profit, $1.7 million is the profit back to your investor at this point and back to the producers off of $75 million. And there's a few other costs in there, the, the guilds and things that also have, there's some, uh, um, the SAG and other organizations have their fees off the top as well. Yeah, you're going you're to have your, your DGA, and WGA, and SAG, and all the unions and everybody that gets any sort of resi residual stuff off of here. Have any, are you guys familiar with what a Kama waterfall looks like? How many of you have seen a Kama? Uh, a Kama is a collection account. So in a collection account, it, you'll see this waterfall laid out. Whenever you do a film and you have a distribution, you have a sales and distribution deal set up, all the money is going to a collection account. That we, it's, we call it Kama. I think it's collection, collection account. Collection account management something. Something is yeah. the last day. And so when you enter into those agreements, this whole waterfall is outlined. Yeah, you know. and, there's, and there's two main companies that do that. One is called Vintage and the other is Freeway and they're both based in like Denmark or something like that. Yeah, they're in Europe, yeah. yeah somewhere, somewhere in Europe. And what, and what they do, these are, this is industry standard. What you'll do is, and this is something that makes your investor feel very secure as well. So at you as the, as the producer, you know, tell your investors, we're going to set up a CAMA account for the distribution of, of all expenses um, and for all, for all profit. Rece all receipts. All receipts. Re receipts all are receipts. Yeah. So what they'll do is your distribution company, uh, whoever your foreign sales agent is and your domestic distribution, they basically, all of the money that comes into them, they send to this CAMA account. And so this third party company then is responsible for doing all the distribution. So they've got all the contracts for your investors, they've got the contracts for all your, all your sales companies and everything, and what they do then is they take 1% essentially, and then they'll distribute as the monies come in by based on whatever the percentages are. And so sort of that waterfall that you that you saw where all the percentages are, that company will send you a, a monthly report or a quarterly report or whatever it is. And, and they send the wires and you know every, everything is processed through them. So yeah, everything's wire transferred. And so it makes your it makes your investors feel much more comfortable because it's not like, yeah, I'm the producer and I just got all this money in and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll pay you. Uh, yeah, I'll be sure to send send the money your way. Yeah, so for example, like, you know, let's say my film LLC that I set up for this, at some point, I just want to like close my books and end the LLC. I can just send a notice to the CAMA account and say, hey, now going forward, please distribute according to, the, to these people in these percentages. So whatever I was supposed to get, now distribute to all these people and they give notice, you can close up your accounts and then they'll get 1099s directly from that collection company. Yeah. And it, it makes it a lot simpler too because then as a producer, you yourself are not responsible for 
paying SAG and paying, you know, these other organizations that are getting those residual amounts because that's what you have to do out of everything that comes in too. So unless you are an accountant and it just, it simplifies things a lot. It's worth paying that 1%. Um, and again, it depends on the scale of your film. If you're doing a $100,000 movie or something like that and you've cobbled the, film, the money together, you're not going to bother doing a camera account. But you start getting, you know, even in a half million dollar range, it makes sense mm -hmm. in, the, in the half million dollar range to, yeah. you know, to do that. No, they, they take one percent off the top. Receipts, yeah, but it's capped. So sometimes you can you can negotiate. It's capped at five thousand dollars a year, ten thousand dollars a year. There's a cap to it too. Yeah, it's not it's not one percent forever. Yeah, and so um so this is something that any uh, any independent film just a quick breakdown basically on uh, you know how do films make money. Um, many of you may or may not know that the, really the the way you're going to make your money is off of your foreign sales. So there are about fifty international territories out there and when you get a sales agent that sales agent's job is to sell every single territory individually and maximize and see how much money they can get from every single one of those territories towards your film basically um, the box office really doesn't matter because you know <laughs> let's say you put your film out there in Germany and it's out in the UK and it's wherever else with well, the distribution company in those territories they're the ones who are, who are collecting that money and they've offered you a minimum amount up front. UK is going to give you $10,000 for your movie. Germany is going to give you $10,000. Spain is going to give you $3,000. And you're basically cobbling together these 50 different territories to try and equal your budget plus profit to be able to pay back your investors. Uh, let me share some perspective on this too. So I have seen, so I, I'm, a, I'm a nerd. I go into the data, I analyze the numbers and all this other stuff. And I've actually seen, like, I'm like, oh, this movie, you know, they lost a ton of money on this. And then you talk to the foreign sales agents and they say, no, the investors didn't lose money on this. So because, uh, because of the sales that they made in foreign territories, the investors actually made money, even though the movie didn't make money in the public box office, and it may take a long time to make money in you know, the different ancillary channels to the distributors who paid. But again, the distributors are buying this stuff because they need content for their platforms. They're buying it for a wide range of reasons. And so uh, they might be getting advertising dollars based on the cast and so on. So they've got advertisers galore. They're making revenues from commercials. And so um, the foreign sales process subsidizes the cost significantly. So if you take into account the foreign sales, the tax incentives, um, and then eventually your domestic sale, even though you, we as laymen may not see the kind of numbers that that film did, it may have made the investors and the teens a lot of money. Yeah. And so, now here, here's something with foreign sales that I hear all the time. The um, people say, oh, but you're taking a discount when you do a pre-sale, for example. So before the film's even made, if you have a good script and you've got some key casts attached, you can sell the foreign rights to that movie in advance before the film's even made. And so, well, some people say, but you're still not at a discount. Well, as a financier, you know, we're always, we always consider what's called the time value of money. And so that the dollar today is worth more than the dollar tomorrow. And for every dollar that I'm taking a risk with, I adjust the present value based on the associated risk. And so if the dollar I'm investing is matched by a contract by a foreign buyer, then the associated risk is lower. So when I discount that future cash flow to the present value, I'm using a lower rate, which means it's worth more to me today. So yeah, it is, there is going to be a discount, but there's also risk in place. Um, uh, but at the same time, I think, my view is many times the foreign sales that we see from a, I call it a risk-adjusted basis, is a no-brainer. Yeah, it is a discount for sure, but for the risk you're taking, it's a huge relief. So for example, like in you know, the Middle East, um, I think $150,000 is just the magic number. Almost every movie I've been involved with, Middle East pays 150. You know, that's just the number. Uh, but so I actually don't expect like the middle. The Middle East itself is not a huge market. There aren't that many people. So even if this thing breaks out, okay, how much more am I really going to do in revenues in the Middle East, right? So I'll take that 150 as a pre-sale today. I have a contract in place. Um, a, a really hot market is Russia. CIS, it's been, yeah. the numbers, if you look in, if you look in movies uh, on Box Office Mojo, uh, you'll see, like, Russia, like, wow, it's, like, for the size of, like, that market, it's actually, like, it, um, they do good revenues, and so they pay. And so we go to these foreign territories and pre-sell those rights. Then there's some territories, there's not, you know, you have a billion people, over a billion people, like in India, you only get 15 grand. 
and it's because it's like there's so much supply of movies there. And like the average ticket movie ticket price in India is a dollar or two dollars, whereas in China it's seven, eight dollars. And so it's uh, each market has its own unique dynamics. But um, for me, I don't expect huge, you know, and um, overflow in the foreign markets. But where I do want to, you know, as an investor, I also want the opportunity to make a lot of money. And so I don't necessarily always pre-sell my domestic. You know, I want to be able to get the film made, you know, test it and see, okay, is this something that, you know, we could, we, a, a studio could pick it up or one of the, the we, I, I, call, I call them the mini majors, you know, the, the second specialty. Um, a mini major could pick it up. Uh, we're doing that right now with a film uh, that we have uh, that stars Lily Collins and Simon Pegg. And we've done so much to it. We're going to uh, test screen it before we go to the next market in November, American film market, and uh, for domestic buyers, you know, do a nice little, you know, dog and pony show and uh, make them feel really good. But the domestic value is where I want to roll my dice. Now, on the domestic side too, so when we talk about foreign sales, there's one other thing we do too. Um, I, I don't feel comfortable always doing it in advance, but we, in this uh, last movie, we actually, after we made the movie, and we were able to show some footage, we got a higher price, we did what's called a domestic backstop deal. What that is, is a US distributor says, okay, I'll pay you X, and I'll, in this particular case, I'll tell you it's, it's 1.2 million, okay? I'll pay you 1.2 million for this movie, but I'm gonna give you a shopping period. And then during the shopping period, which starts on the first day that you screen it to other US distributors, you have 90 days from that day to close a better deal, except for with their direct competitors. So it has to be like if a big studio, mini major, you know, some uh, Amazon, Netflix comes in. In this particular case, we also negotiated a little carve out for Lifetime because it's uh, um, a female driven movie. So we thought maybe, and we don't want to go to Lifetime, um, but if they, if they want to make their, I, I forget what it's called, so a Lifetime, um, Premier, like it's one of their own premieres where they do a premiere where it's branded a lifetime. Yeah, a lifetime movie, yeah. So I've heard that you know, lifetime may, three, may pay on the top end two and a half to three million. Okay, so I'm at one point two million now, but I have the option to shop it to them. If no other big studio bites, then what happens is this: I'm going to sell the lifetime because if I don't do it, what well, these guys who are paying me one point two million, they'll actually ultimately do a TV deal with Lifetime, they'll get that money, <laughs> and I'll, now I'm gonna only get 50% of that, you know? And so it's uh, better for me to take that deal today, although for my actors, I don't wanna do like, like, you know, star actors don't want their movies to go to Lifetime, you know? So you'll actually hurt some of your relationship and reputation in that deal, but, um, you know, but so I get this shopping period of 90 days from the first screening to go get a better deal, and so, but what was it? So I was going to say, so now, uh, after the film is made, I've actually fully hedged my risk. And I, if, I, if I go to someone else, I pay them a breakup fee. In this particular case, I think it's $200,000. And so um, I'm happy to pay them $200,000 if I'm getting three, four, or five million. It's just, uh, but at least my downside risk, the other side is, if no one shows up, um, that film could be worth 200 grand, half a million. So I've, I've hedged the risk in my film. So if I understand what you said, you pre-sold porn to reduce risk, and then you have this um, backstop. Backstop. backstop deal. Um, now, have you, based on the expenses to produce one, there's no P and A involved here because you're not. So, have you broken even? On we're, we're already ahead. Okay, so yeah, because we also got the tax incentive. Uh, we filmed in Alabama where we got 25 percent of the total budget above the line and below the line. And so we've actually, we're, we're already in the green right now, or black, I guess, yeah. And that's, <laughs> why, it's so, it. that's why it's so important for films, and that's why Georgia, Louisiana, Alabama, you know, New Mexico, these states are doing so well, is because it makes an investor secure in putting money into a film. It's one of the things, you know, here in the state of Florida, we don't have a tax incentive, but we've got our great local incentive, which helps out because you can also really, you know, the strategy, not to get in the weeds on what, local strategy is, but you know, if, it, if, if a film is $2 million or less, we can yeah. have it make sense to shoot here because you can do union rates like IOPSI that's a tier zero or a tier Screen one out. or something. Yeah, the, the, the cost of production is lower here, so we do comparisons between some of the other states. Now, the only thing is with that 25% of like Alabama, if you have a star, you know, and you're paying big money, well, you're getting 
25% of that money back that you're paying them, because that count up to a million dollars counts. Whereas um, you can't, you can't. I mean, that cost is a cost. Whereas here in Florida, the actual below the line production costs you can control much more effectively. So is the excuse me, I don't mean to jump in. I think you might have the same question. Is the linchpin here of making these deals the stars you have attached? Yeah, so the star is what sells foreign. So in that movie, the last, this last movie, we have um, Lily Collins and Simon Pegg. Simon Pegg is huge in the foreign markets. You know, he is just, I and mean, people just love Simon Pegg overseas. So people have paid significant dollars for that. Um, I'll tell you, so we have a movie that's shooting right now in Boston. Um, our star in that is Diane Keaton. Okay, she's getting a big check. But... We've got, like, the, for the amount we're paying her, Germany paid the, the same amount. So I'm like, okay, well, okay. We got her covered just with Germany. So the Germans paid, paid, basically paid her fee for us, you know? So she, so this, uh, although she's only in, like, 18 pages of the movie. She's not, you know, she's only in 18 pages. And so, but uh, she's getting paid a handsome fee, and we got that recoup from Germany. And so, the, uh, but the star is what sells. So, do you have her sign a letter of intent, and that's how you can get your pre-sales? No, so th this is all like, this is all part of the massaging process, relationships, and so on. So, okay. and this is where the foreign sales agents help. So, the key people in negotiating these deals with the stars, the foreign sales agents, the director, and the agency. And so, what happens is this. So, the the big stars don't want you to use their name to get it financed. But the foreign sales agents and the, ag and the agents for the, ca the cast, they talk. I'm like, okay, we got you. There's a soft, you know, okay, we'll work with you. And the foreign sales agents will, will go out and solicit with their buyers because now these buyers in the foreign markets are, it's a, it's a circle. Everyone knows each other. We all talk. And so they will, you know, lock up soft commitments. And so there's the, this trust that has to be there between the financier, star, director, everyone, foreign intelligence. And so we, like, so for the, the, this particular film, Dankin did not want to use her name to get, you know, the film financed. But, all the whispers, and then we, she told us that, uh, we were told that we can get, and this, this budget is a $9.2 million budget movie. Um, we were told that we can get through five territories, 2.6 million pre-sales with Diane Keaton, okay? And we're filming in Boston where we have a $2 million incentive. So now I'm 4.6 million, half my budget is covered from only five territories and tax incentives. So they made the offer, a pay or play offer letter. Pay or play means like you're gonna get the money one way or the other. And so um, it's a hard offer to Diane Keaton. And so she signed the next day, the pre-sale contracts were signed. We didn't use you to get this contract. We signed the contracts after uh, we made you the offer, you know? And so we didn't need, you know, you beforehand. You know, we, we, there are some actors who will play with you. So sometimes some smart actors will actually put on a producer hat. So my second movie, we had Ty Sheridan, uh, who was a star in, uh, he was the uh, main character in Ready Player One, Spielberg's movie. If any of you saw that, he's the kid, the main kid, Ready Player One. So he attached himself to a movie. This movie, The Night Clerk, is a, a story about an autistic adult who works as a night clerk in a hotel. And his, one of his childhood friends was autistic, had uh, Asperger's, and this, it's about a child with Asperger's, and, or a young man with Asperger's. And so it was meaningful to him. So he, you know, fell in love with the script, attached himself, and we were able to pre-sell based on his name. Simon Pegg had a relationship with the director of my third film, and they had done a film together before. And he said, hey, Simon, I want you, they're both British. And so they said, okay, I'll attach myself. So we've pre-sold based on Simon's name. Initially, we had Kate Mara in the female role, but then she got pregnant and she couldn't, you know, um, during the, the, the dates didn't work out for her, you know? And so we got Lily Collins <clears throat> to come in, but we sold, pre-sold on Simon Pegg's name. So there are, um, but with Ty Sheridan, he actually wants to go out and use his name and attach himself to movies and um, be a producer. So. Do you have any experience with the federal government incentives? Federal. In I don't know about federal government. created something like Magnet. 
basically you're spending on movies. The tax, yeah, that is true. I actually don't see it working. Um, they changed the, yeah, they changed the language. It says. Uh, I, I tried. My dad's a CPA, and I, I, I picked his brain. I'm like, come on, there's some way. Like, I, uh, I'm very picky with the English language, and uh, I've actually won um, cases with the arguments with the IRS on the way they use their words. And so, and that's because I couldn't make it work. So the word the language says, you can write it off in the year that it is released. Okay. Well, by the time it's released, I'm hoping I can get my money back. So you can write off 100% of your film budget and take a loss in the year it's released. But typically, like your revenues and are coming in at the same time. So like you'll write it off, but then you'll get the revenues and, and there's no real break. Unless it happens that you release it on December 25th, 26th, you know, around there, end of December. So you write it off for this tax year, and then the revenues come in in the spring of the next year. So you don't see it coming in play? <coughs> it's not a motivating factor. It's a nice thing to get, but none of us have any control over release dates, and so ultimately that's in the hand of a distributor who is not looking out for your tax, you know. But there's no real benefit, it's all you're doing is deferring your um, taxes for that short period of time. Florida does have a incentive on a sales tax exemption. Um, yes. There's, yeah, it's... <coughs> I don't know how much, so when you're comparing apples to apples with other states, I don't think it makes a difference. No, but it is a good, um, good for, for homemakers. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So, so like if uh, you have an investor that's looking for a uh, tax shelter for, for money, then it really doesn't work then? There's zero tax shelter benefit. Because, I mean, you could defer for one year, okay. you know, so, but, like I said, it's the law says you can write it off 100% of your budget. You know, just like depreciation, if you you know in, in real estate, you can depreciate. Or if you're a business owner, uh, the tax law change in 2017 allows you to write off 100% of any furniture, fixture, equipment, capital improvement you make in that tax year. Um, and then in the past, you normally would depreciate your investment over five years, ten years, seven years, depending on the nature of the asset. So with this, you're writing it off year in the hundred percent of the budget in one year. But then if you if a few months later within the same calendar year you're getting all your revenues, right? So then there's no real incentive. Actually I think maybe I need to go back and look at my tax return and see. Well so Bernie the Dolphin was released in December twenty eighteen. But I didn't get my money until twenty nineteen. To like January. January nineteenth. Right, so we're yeah. gonna, so we're gonna, maybe that could work, you know? <laughs> Alright, so here we go. We're back up, got the screen up. We our problem was we talked too much without moving without touching the screen. Uh, okay. screen. So here's some examples of some Did you want to go back one thing just to some recent any, films? On the tax I think the tax stuff. Did anyone have questions on tax stuff or is that pretty straightforward? Just make sure you give me a finder's fee if you get any more money now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's a, the, so for Florida, the state of Florida, it's a 7% sales tax. It just makes it easier on your production when you're filming. You're, you're not going to have to pay sales tax. So it's not really an incentive. You're just saving 7% of anything you pay sales tax on. And there are some markets in Florida, us, Tampa, Miami, that have a, uh, an incentive program about 10%. Um, but here's some examples of some films and sort of what they've done uh, as far as their budget, their pre-sales, and their total sales. And so what, I want, what we want to do is give you some examples of what a sales sheet actually looks like from your sales agent, where they're going to break down all the different territories that you could potentially you know, be selling your film in. And you'll see over here that they have the stars, right? So in the sales, they always want to market who the stars are. They're selling off the cast and the script. Yeah, so Anna Kendrick, John C. Riley, Molly Shannon. Um, you can see what's your minimum guarantee amount. That's the amount that the distributor is going to pay to you for your film. And so you're looking at a $2.5 million budget while well, you're, you're getting a $3, uh, $3 million, um, you know, you already got your money back just from the United States from your domestic deal right off the, right off the top there. Here's the rest of the territories. So the rest of the territories. So, you know, you take a look at, and what's interesting too is you can see the percentages from each territory. 16.6 .6 from Eastern Europe, Middle East and Africa, 3.4%, 11% from China. You know, the totals at the bottom there. 
So you go back and see the column. So you had ask, the take, and the minimum guarantee. So the ask is what the sales agent's gonna ask for your film. The take is what they're willing to accept from So the take, sales. as a financier, I'm typically looking at the take. First, first I wanna make sure uh, I'm vetting the sales agent. Are they credible? Or, you know, are they just making numbers up? Or are they credible? So some of the best sales agents have great reputations with financiers because they know they deliver on the takes. And so the takes are what we underwrite to. You know, so we look at the total uh, foreign, and so ideally in my budgets, I wanna see coverage between the foreign takes and the tax incentive, and to have domestic be my upside. Yeah, and so and what you can see here too, so I did a little uh, reverse engineering to get these numbers, because there's a, there's a company called Film Take where you can actually buy these reports, where you can buy these reports of sales for, for particular films. But what they'll do is they will take out the name of the film and they'll take out the stars. But they will tell you it's a male star that's between 35 and 40 years old, and it has the names of the distribution company. So if you sort of reverse engineer and go into IMDb Pro or Box Office Mojo, and you start with some of the numbers, you can backtrack and you can figure out what the films were. So I actually sort of reverse engineered to figure out what these films were based off all of the other data that they provided. So this is not, this is not information that is publicly available anywhere. You will literally never be able to find this information anywhere. This is, uh, this is the amount of me doing a lot of research and backtracking to figure, uh, figure out all this information. Can you go page two real quick? Sure. So here, you'll see the international total. So, and then the difference between the international and the, and the grand is the domestic. So we try to work off of the international take, the 3.9 million, take the tax incentive, what that's worth, and then I like to be where the sum of those two is 130 to 140% of my budget. And so, take the international take value, the total, so the, um, this is a different film now, right? So, yeah, it's a different film. Okay, and this one, the total international is 6.7 million, right? 8.5 includes the domestic take value. So take is the lower end of that value. And so 6.7 million plus my tax incentive, where I'm filming, if, if any, if I'm filming somewhere that has a tax incentive, I take the sum of those two, divide that by 1.3 to 1.4, and that's where I'd like my budget to be. Yeah. And that's what I, as an investor, so we're talking about film financing, as an equity investor, that's what I'm looking to be, have, have my comfort. Um, and there's a couple of different things we do too. So in this uh, most recent movie with Simon Pegg Lily Collins, actually with the foreign sales, we had, a for, we had a lender come in and take the foreign sales and the tax incentive as collateral. And my investment, so they have a first Think of like a mortgage, they have a first lien, first position against the foreign sales and the tax incentive until they get their money back. I then took, we bifurcated it, my investment has a first position against the domestic value. So we have two different parallel tracks and so my investment has a first position against whatever the domestic value is. And so um, now, and then we both have seconds against, oh thank you, we both have seconds against each other. So after they get, if, they, if the foreign sells out tremendously, and I actually do expect the foreign to do really well, um, then I actually will get my money back. Like I said, I had the right to make, get my money back just from the foreign, and the, and the domestic is all upside. And so after they get their money back from the foreign, the tax incentives, then I recoup from there. And then if, if I haven't already recouped from the domestic sale. And so that's another way you can bifurcate. So these numbers, you know, can be, you can chop up. And I even know some film producers who, who they, they themselves will finance part of their own film. They'll say, I'm just going to buy, let's say, I'm just going to buy airlines for 250. I'll, I'll just buy it myself. I'll have my first against 250. I, I, I know that market, and I think I can do better than 250. So if over time, you start learning the different, what the buyers are doing in the different markets. And you can, once you know those buyers, you know, you go to these markets, you know, you might meet someone you know, at a restaurant somewhere, a bar somewhere, in one of these markets, and they're a buyer for some territory, you build a relationship, and you can vet that with them. It's like, you know what, I'm just gonna buy that one territory myself and negotiate that myself, you know? So, uh, but that's how these, uh, just like, you know, on, in Wall Street, they can slice and dice mortgages and stuff, but we can slice and dice territories uh, in this structure as well. Yeah, and, and one of the important things to consider is, you know, like if you have a one, say a $1 million budgeted film, you need to make more than $1 million back 
in order to be able to pay back your investors, to be able to have you know the sales agents getting their fees and their cuts. And we do have some examples of that too um, that we'll uh, that we'll move on to here. I know it's it's a lot to throw at you, but that's why we wanted to really dig into the nitty gritty of this. I'm trying to show the creative stuff we do, you know, like yes. that. Not this is important. You can't you can't do the creative side if you don't understand. Uh, you know this. This is a very that's a very important sheet that we look at. That and the budget are the two things. Yeah. Like, you know, I compare all the time. Yeah, these, these pages right here are something you will constantly be looking at with your sales agents and always, always wanting to see. You know, what the ask, what's the take, what's the MG, who's distributing, and, and really digging in, digging into those numbers. Um, the main markets where these deals happen every year. European film market, March City Film in Can, Toronto, and then coming up next, uh, November sixth, starts the uh, American film market in. Santa Monica. Um, here are some examples of sort of the average, like he talked about, he said 150 grand is a number I always see out of the Middle East. Well, here are some examples of those average takes for films in this one to five million dollar range. And this is information from Film Take, which is the, uh, the company I talked about where you can buy these reports to sort of read these reports. They have Netflix sales sheets. They're, they're not cheap reports, but it really provides a lot of important uh, data and information. You can see in there you know, I don't know. If Germany and France are huge markets. Those yeah. are our biggest, two of our biggest foreign uh, sales. G um, Germany, France, Japan. China, actually, even though it's a big market, it's 50 50 because uh, China has uh, um, restrictions, how do they call it? Uh, there's a, a limitation, what's the word for that? Uh, yeah, they have some censorship. No, no, no. They only allow, but they have a quota. Well, there's a quota. There's that's a quota. Like 30, 30 films per year. From the U.S. From the U.S. Yeah. So. If that get the 30 films a year that get theatrical. So the value of your film is binary. If you get theatrical, it's worth this. If you don't get theatrical, it's worth this. So you're like, okay, well, I'll take this number here. So your number is a little lower compared to the size of the market in China because it, the, the value is binary because of the quota system, where other countries don't have the same quota system. I mean, you can find ways around that. If you have a producer who's Canadian and you make it, oh, there's a Canadian film now instead of an American film. <laughs> There's, there's interesting we're, we're, yeah, we're, we do some interesting things. ways of doing things like that. So here's here's an example of kind of what is your what is your indie film going to cost you? What's like what's it actually? What do you need to make to actually make this happen for you? Um, and if you remember that you know your investor, you as the producer only own fifty percent of your film. Your investor owns 50% of your movie, or however you negotiate. You can negotiate 60, 40, 70, 30, whatever you do, but typically it's 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50 split. And not only are they putting money in, but they're getting, you know, they gotta get a premium on their money. So it can be anywhere from 10, 15, 20%. Again, that's negotiable with your investors, but that's, you know, typically- Depends on the risk, like I said before. Yeah. Right, exactly. Um, and don't forget your sales agent charges a fee on top of it, and there's a marketing cost. Uh, from your sales company as well. And the amount of that marketing cost is negotiable with your sales agent as well. So, you know, just throw up there, let's say you've got a film with a $1.5 million budget, your investors need to get back their 15%, your sales agent sells $2 million, so you've got $2 million in sales on a $1.5 million budget. We'll take away that marketing fee, take away that sales fee. Um, now, what the investor can, or what the sales company can do is they can defer and and that's just like St. Josh, I know like this, they like that sales agent to defer some of their percentage until after the investor has their money back yeah. first. And what, what's typical is um, the sales agents will get 5% non-deferred off the top, and then in the waterfall, the investors recoup their capital and their premium, and then the sales agent collects the rest of their fee. If it's 15, they get 10% more. Um, and then then there's a deferral pool, so if any of the, any of the talent production teams deferred any of their fees, then they recoup. And then it goes into the waterfall, it's 50, 50, 50% 50 to the creative, 50% to the investors. Yeah. Um, and as it continues to, you know, to break down, um, and this is just this one particular example, you know, you've got your, your sales fee, the investors get their money back, the investors are still owed their 15% premium. So let's say you've worked in a state where you've got film incentives, so you give your $300,000 back. So what does that leave you? Basically, if you as the producer, uh, whatever your fee was for making the movie, that's the money you've made. You haven't made anything off of $2 million in sales yet. You haven't put a dime in your pocket as far as your percentage of, of, of profits. But profits. You, you have a fee in the budget. Yes. But, uh, yeah, that's yeah, whatever that. your producer fee was in the budget. But once you get to the back end, you, know, you, haven't, you haven't made any money yet uh, because the people that give you the money need to make their money first, basically, and the people who sell the movie for you. So it can be, it can be complicated. So ideally, you know, you want your sales and incentives to be at least 150% of the, 
of what the budget of your film is so you can get everybody else paid back and then hopefully make some money yourself in there. So the cheaper you can make a movie, the better you're off. No, not necessarily. Um, you know, like, with, with, with standard of stars and yeah, we, I, I, you know, I think that I, I look at filmmaking as an entrepreneurial environment where you have to be gritty. You know, but you know, I always, you know, actually, also one of the most painful things that I negotiate with my producers, they, they say, well, if we don't use a contingency, can we split it 50-50? You know, get, can I keep some of it? I think that's the wrong incentive. Like, no, I want that money on the screen. You know, and uh, I don't want them to be incentivized to take money away from the screen. You still have to use your money smartly. And it might be that you use the contingency to do test screening, you know, after in post. There's so much things to me. I look at post, that you need to save some money for the post production and make sure the extra quality and um, maybe investing in that trailer that you want to create. Music. Music. And so uh, I just want to make sure I get good quality, good value. You know, and, and so it's very much like, you know, you can pay more for people who don't need to be managed or you can pay a little bit less you might have more work, but you might save, you know, a lot of money by just, but you know, it might be something, it, like in post-production, for example, there are post houses that'll charge you a lot more to do work, and there are post houses that'll charge you less. But the ones who charge you less, you may have to be there and more actively manage it. But if it, for many people, it's just their nature to be there anyways, to actively manage their, their it's just your product. And so uh, if you're the type, you know, that is gonna be there anyways, well, why pay the premium for a post house that supposedly, I, I don't believe in the model that you pay more and th th those guys will take care of you. No, I believe that you have to be gritty on site and make sure you're paying attention to the details. No one knows it better than you and the vision for the product. And so you have to be there anyway, so get a better price and more actively manage it. And so here's a, here's a little bit of a breakdown of sort of the, uh, the average distribution fees. And again, this comes from Stephen Follows, which you haven't been to his website today. Please go and check it out. He's really going to, you know, really going to really breaks down all the details of what you're spending in development, production, post-production, post -production, your sales and distribution. And he does this off of, you know, looking at thousands and thousands of films over a, over, over a time period. But you can see, um, you know, where the commission is and what people keep from revenues from your sales agent to the U.S. distributor, international distributor, cinema movie theater. I, you know, we use that 50-50 model. You know, his percentage here is 44%. Um, so again, take some time to kind of dig into this, uh, dig into this data and really learn the business because that's, you know, you don't know what you don't know, sort of thing. Um, and we've went over this a little bit, but again, it's sort of another example of a of financing a film on how to finance the tax incentives and the pre-sales and you know let's you know use Louisiana as an example with a 30% um, tax credit but you, know, you get that tax credit at 30% well the state of Louisiana doesn't give you a check for 30% of your movie they give you a tax credit which you have to turn around and sell to somebody to actually get the cash for the movie so you really end up with generally about 25% of of your money instead of that that 30% unless you have a business yourself that you're financing tax credit to save on your own on your own tax debt. Um, again, try and get around 30% of your film's budget pre-sold if possible. Tax incentives, and there's the sort of your samples and what you know Sam Tosh was talking about a little bit on sample two there with the backstop and using um, you know the foreign debt to secure the pre-sale and um, having a first lien and and so yeah, on. Yeah, like in this particular film here, there's a four point eight million dollar budget. Um, like I told you, we had a foreign lender, we had a lender secured by the foreign rights pre-sales for the day loan, 2.8 million. The key, key talent um, and producers deferred about a million of fees. And so that, that got to 3.8, so they're short a million. So I funded a million secured by a first position against the domestic rights, which now we backstop with a $1.2 million backstop deal. The lender is only looking at the foreign pre-sale contracts. Okay. So they're lending. Right. They're lending 80% of the foreign sales contracts um, because 20% rent is a deposit that those foreign buyers are paying you up front. Okay. So you're getting 20 percent So they're lending the balance, which is 100% of the remainder, 80%. Plus, they'll lend you, I think, 90%, 85 to 90% of the tax incentive. And so 
in some states it's a check. New Louisiana is a tax credit that you have to sell. Yeah. But some states just give you a check. Yeah. So if it's a rebate so. program, um, you know, it's just straight up check. For our local incentive stuff from St. Pete Clearwater Film Commission, Tampa Film Commission, that's just a check that you get that you get right. as well. So they'll lend eighty-five to ninety percent of that, and then again, if you have a good, and they also, by the way, in pre-sales, the distributors who signed who are making these offers, they have their own database of who's legit, who's not. Right, so they already know uh, who the uh, the buyers are. They can, they can bank, and then um, they'll lend you fifty percent against the unsold foreign territories. So that's called the gap loan. So so there's a senior loan, a gap loan, and equity. So in this case, uh, two point three million of it was senior, five hundred thousand was gap, and our million was equity, but we were first against the domestic. And there, there are certain companies that'll loan you the money. Uh, Three Point Capital is one, Bondit is another company. There are certain banks out in uh, uh, LA that'll do it as well. So you just have to find the banks um, that'll do it. And your, your sales, depending on who your sales team is, your sales company should know. They know the players. Those relationships as well. Yeah. Okay. Yes? So, so tell me this, right? If you want to film a local uh, movie here, Tax exempt, so that's around 8%. Then get 10% from Canelos, 10% from Hillsboro, so you're about 28%. Yeah, essentially, what's not, not quite like that, that 7%, it's not a percentage you get back, that's just what you're saving on sales tax. So you're not saving sales tax on any crew wages that you're paying, you know, construction costs or equipment you know, that you're buying, things like that, you're going to save that 7% sales tax on. So you can't call the f a proper 7% off your entire film because you're not paying sales tax on every yeah. single Yeah, it never shows up in your budget. Your budget shows the uh, cost right. net of sales tax. Yeah, yeah. so you so you're, you're, your budget is not money. But you can essentially, if you if you film correctly between Tampa and Hillsboro, you can get that basically 20% locally for doing it. And there's uh, it's capped, right? several films. That, several there's films there's that. a cap. Yes, there's a dollar cap. So, yeah, depending again, depending on where on what you're doing, you know, you're not going to come in here and shoot a ten million dollar film and expect to get two million dollars back because we don't have that <laughs> money for the local, you know, um, you know, locals to give to give out. So that's not something they're going to do. What expenses would the tax exempt come into play? Hotel rooms and that kind of thing, or? Uh, yeah, so you can save seven percent on on hotel rooms if you go to film in Florida dot com or dot org, which is the state site. It has all the information on the sales tax incentive there and gives you like the full breakdown on on, on, on what it is. So as we get close to wrapping up, we'll be able to get through so we can get into all the Q and A's. We'll kind of go through these last few slides and everything here. Um, some common misconceptions about films, and we've talked a lot about this already, is that you know films must have a theatrical release. Um, and like we talked about early on, theatrical releases are expensive and they can cause a film to lose a lot of money. You look at that pie chart there, you can see you know, almost 40% of independent films shot in 2017 got no theatrical release whatsoever. Large release was only 17%, 35% for a nominal release. And you can see the genres there, action, adventure, horror, rom-com, thriller, as to which one's got no release and which one's got you know, the, largest, uh, the largest release. And at the bottom there, that domestic P&A spend. So again, I can't, I can't say enough good things about the data that Stephen Follows provides. On, on a lot of this stuff. Another little breakdown there of uh, domestic versus international box office. And again, this, you're talking looking at a 20 year period by genre. Take a, take a look at the orange lines on the left columns there, how the international box office has risen and how the domestic has dropped and see where they're kind of crossing there in the years where they're crossing. And you can see you know, just how, how, how important sort of your domestic sales are. And these other little pie charts were breaking down you know, your publicity and your trailers and your print marketing and your television, just sort of what your, your costs and your payout structure are for everything. So, so this is our last I'm slide. Do you want to go back? Yeah, yeah. Well, I do want to share something so that um, China, you know, has been expanding their box office. This, this data is on percentages of box office. So as China has been growing as a box office, market for box office revenues. That's also one of the reasons why you see this thing yeah. too, because before, I mean, if you had very little, and they've grown, and they're about the same, almost the same size as the US, so as a percentage of worldwide revenues, you know, them growing is what's causing some of this too. Yeah. Um, but overall, you know, they say they, some of the numbers I was here, uh, very, uh, it's not based on this data like Tony has, but about, you know, 600 films get made a year, 100 films get 
theatrical of those 150 are the big, you know, 50 weekends are the big studio movies. So there's 50 left, you know, out of the 50 out of the remaining 550. So 10% have a chance at wide box office, and many of those end up being those get like get nominated for Oscars and things like that. So you have to have something really unique to get uh, um, into the box office. Yeah. And so sort of kind of the last thing we were talking about is, you know, the reasons that people invest in film. And Santosh mentioned this earlier. Um, you know, you want to do it as an investment to make money, which the word investor, that's typically, you know, what they want. Um, which an average timeline, typically about 18 months, could be longer, could be 24 months. Um, uh, if there's a story that you want to tell, something important that you want to say, and sort of social issues for the experience, because you know film is fun and cool, and you just want to be you want to be a part of that world, uh, to support artists, your local community, or you know sort of sort of all of the above. So there's a, there's a lot of reasons people make films, a lot of reasons people put money into films, and whether you're investing in film or you are asking people to invest in your film, you know, take these things into consideration and be honest with the people that are putting money into your projects because they need to know upfront, you know, hey, am I gonna make my money back on this or is this just something I'm doing for art and you know, whatever, whatever other reasons I might have. Have any of you listened to um, that, or read that book about Michael Ovitz at all? The Michael Ovitz book? Um, in there he talks about how even the movie The Last Temptation of Christ was a passion project. And in all their low and medium forecasts, they expected to lose money. And uh, they were like, let's go find someone who owes us a favor. You know, we'll find a studio who made a lot of money for, you know. And so the way it got funded initially was based on favors. You know, you, you can afford to lose five million because you made so much on the last film we did with you. And so that was a passion project, actually, for that team. And so, um, it did not lose money. That it, didn't, it didn't lose money. It well but then. initially, it was, you know, I mean, it, it was definitely one of these roller coaster things, all the public PR and everything else when that came out. But it was a passion project, no pun intended. Yeah. Yeah. So, some questions before we wrap it up here. Uh, so, so uh, then, the uh, question is, is uh, like if you, you're financing a film and you have investors coming in, and you have, a, let's say you have a million dollar budget or whatever. Somebody that gets four hundred thousand dollars in the investment, you can basically use that money then to get things done. For instance, like finding stars, uh, the whole thing, have, have, having money in to work with gives you an opportunity to make more money and get investors. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, so ha having that four hundred thousand dollars in in cash. You can turn it into a million dollars by shooting, you know, somewhere where you get some sort of incentive. You get the, you have four hundred thousand dollars, so now you can get talent attached. You can tell, you can tell talent, yes, we have our financing in place. Can we attach you to this project? Then you go out and do your pre-sales, and but you got to have something you have to, have to start with. You don't need a million yeah. dollars to make a million dollar movie, right. but four hundred thousand is about the right number to get started yeah. for that. Yes, and, and so we call that a bridge loan. Okay. So initially, you have a script, a concept, and you need to find an investor who can bridge you. Um, but you don't always need it, you know. Again, what in, in the fun, in the funnel that I work in, I look for scripts that foreign sales agents have already said, "Hey, this is a good script," and they'll help you bring the right cast, put the team together. And again, like I said, they have relationships with the agents and everything else in LA. So they'll, they'll find the right team. So it's about you know finding the right sales agent who fits with you and getting them. To, that's another way to do it. But it, uh, you know, even you still need some of these professionals, in, insider professionals, to help you to get to the cast that you need. Hey, what I hear here is that mostly all the information that I'm getting is from somebody that is already starting the process and everything. We are going to do our first movie. We already had the okay from the person to film the movie. Now we are in the process of finding everything together. Right. So how hard is it to to get to these um, investors? Yeah. So you so you don't have experience. You don't have. You yeah. have idea what you're doing. So you have you have an you have an act you have your script and you you say you have an actor in place. No, no, no. We have basically what we did an idea for a very good movie. You have an idea. You have an idea for a good movie. And we had okay from the. Based on a true story, so gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Well, so it's a uh, you need a.
producer to kind of help you out. The biggest thing in this industry, as many of you know and have learned by now, is it's not what you know, it's who you know, which is why it's important to go to, you know, if you can't afford to go to Los Angeles all the time and go to, say, American Film Market or go to the other things, you know, that's why local film festivals like Sunscreen and Gasparilla, um, and those are really, the, you know, sort of the main two that have this, you know, they have producers who know what they're doing coming in. They have sales agents that are coming into those festivals and you meet those people and build those relationships. And so in a lot of times, like you have, you know, once you get your, starts with the script, you gotta have the script first. Um, you know, if you wanna start attaching talent, Part of it is just hiring a casting director. You can hire a casting director out of Los Angeles um, and pay, say, five to ten thousand dollars for that casting director, and say, "Here are the roles I'm looking for. Here's, you know, what I need," and then try and get the script to them through that casting director. If you don't know, you know, the agents, because if you call up just an agency, you're going to call CAA or WME or ICM or whoever it is, and say, "Hey, I'd love uh, for Brad Pitt to be in my next movie." Um, you know, you're never, you're never going to get, you're never going to get through. It's not going to happen. And so there is another workshop that we did um, on how to get your script or idea made that we've got on the Film Commission's YouTube channel, where we actually go into for about 35, 40 minute long video breaking down your exact question right there. So I would recommend going to the Film Commission's YouTube channel and watching that particular video because it's the same thing, but in much more detail. That you know. And I'll add this, that the word producers, okay, so there's a lot of different producers. <laughs> so first, okay, so first is a, a, a line producer, is your person who can help you with your budget. Now, they're busy, it takes time to put these budgets together, but maybe you can say, hey, can you give me some other budgets from other movies you've made? And you, you, wanna, you should learn the budgeting process for a movie. It's very important, and it helps, you know, when, you're, when you have your script, you know, my budget, what, what my budgeting things are too expensive? Are there, you know, are houses blowing up, cars crashing? Or is it, you know, people talking in a cafe? You know, what is it? So each of these things have, has a cost. So you want to be able to get an understanding of what the budget for this film is going to be before cast. So then there's producers who have relationships with talent and agencies. They're just networkers. You know, they know people. Those are producers too. Um, well, I had a whole list of other people too, but uh, but there's the, the and then there's the producers who are really good at taking the project from start to finish. You know, they're the guys who deal with all the headaches, negotiate all the contracts, and they're just good problem solvers from start to finish, who, and who understand and appreciate the vision. They're, they're the execution uh, professionals. So, but I think the line, you know, on my team, my business partner line is a trained line producer. So when I look at deals, I want to know. Is this budget realistic? Like, if I'm investing in this, is, is someone giving me BS or is it a real budget? And so, having someone who's that, like, it's like a high powered accountant, but for the film industry, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. And so much of it, if you just have a concept or just have a script, is you got to get the script out there. And a lot of, of way, one way you can do that is there are so many script contests out there where you can enter the scripting contest, get coverage on your script from third parties who have no idea who you are, no idea if they've read your script before, that will tell you if your script, you know, um, is is good or what you can do to improve it and you know very valuable stuff but you know watch the video that kind of delves into delves into all of that. And so once you get that, oh, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Raise your hand. Go ahead. So once you've done that, right? You've gotten <clears throat> excuse me, your scripts out there. You've won awards. Then what? What's your next step to get someone that's going to want to read it and yeah. back you? A part of it, watch the video because it breaks it, kind of goes into full, full yeah. detail yeah. of that. But it, but part of it is um, making those relationships with the producers, like you know, like he like he was talking about, you know, going to AFM, going to different film festivals, okay. and being like, hey, I've got this award-winning script that everybody loves. Hey, go to the markets, and you know, the markets they have several things. There's, there's networking events. There's all sorts, and there's actual market. You just go in, and you know, uh, there's plenty of people to talk to, and so go in, talk to people. And uh, and it always helps, you know. I went to my first market with Tony here, and uh, I learned a tremendous amount. And so find people, you know, to uh, you know, you can build trustworthy relationships with. And so uh, then you get introduced to different people. But the markets are so important. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the markets a- are AFM, four. November six is the next time. Yeah. yeah. Good. And, uh, but also, AFM does get intimidating yeah. a little bit, but they do have a lot of networking and educational events. So it is very informative. It's probably the one with the most. Educational event, yeah. I think, right? Yeah. yeah. Where is that? Uh, Santa Monica, coming up November 6th is the, is the next one. Uh, can you talk about, if, if they even exist, uh, any incentives that might be local for commercial filming? Um, no local incentives for commercials. Wow. Commercials are going to come anyway, so we don't incentivize them. I wanted to add to your conversation, if I could. Um, 
One thing you can also think about that's very similar to tax incentives is um, I don't want to encourage everyone to think that product placement is that easy because it's right. not a major thing. Most people are not going yeah. to do But in some <coughs> cases, you can get a brand new car from BMW, sure. you've got the big star, and that's something you're not going to have to rent. Or probably a better example would be um, uh, you know, if, if you had something that took place entirely at a theme park and somehow and it was a positive uh, experience in the movie, perhaps right. you should work out a deal with Bush Gardens where essentially you're being allowed to film for free. And Marine you know, Land, yeah. You know, a <laughs> chunk of your budget now doesn't have to be spent. Well, and, and so, perfect example, the two Bernie the Dolphin films, uh, Marine Land, which is a aquarium facility that does dolphin interactions with people in St. Augustine. Uh, no location fees for using their dolphins, their trainers, for using the facility. That's a lot of money. Nothing at yeah. all. A lot of money. I mean, saved thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And so now, because the relationship has been so good, um, there's an exclusivity with Marineland that nobody else can use Marineland because they've been very happy with that relationship. We got 10 cases of Voss water um, for Bernie the Dolphin as well that you can just, you know, as long as we see it on the screen, you can have these cases of water. Yeah. So there's companies out there who just give you free Zillow paid us $50,000 Zillow paid us fifty thousand dollars for that, this Lily Collins movie. And just because for one, there's one line they say, well, we'll look for a home on Zillow for mom. But then you have to make sure it's in the final cut. It is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it is. Oh, it, is. <laughs> it almost got cut. I'm like, no! <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like that line, yeah. yeah. There was, uh, uh, over the years, I've been uh, doing my job networking, and I'm uh, between a line manager and a, and a producer. I'm the one who lets you know if you're doing this realistically or if, like, you know, you got to change that. Um, what about grants? Uh, grants money of... Uh, it's not an incentive, but it's a, a gift, so to say. Yeah, so there's, yeah, there's a lot of avenues to find money besides the typical... It doesn't have to get paid back. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to find money besides somebody who's just going to give you money. So grants are huge. There are so many different types of grants. There's, you know, the Southern Documentary Filmmaker Grant. There are innumerable types of grants. And there's a lot of sor sources online where you can look for film grants. Uh, Movie Maker Magazine, I think, has a list. Nofilmschool.com, uh, IndieWire. Um, there's, there's several sites out there that always list this list of, you know, tons and tons of grants you can find. Grants, crowdfunding, don't underestimate crowdfunding. You know, being able to, a lot of people have funded their entire films based off of, uh, based off of crowdfunding. So you can do combinations of grants, crowdfunding, investors, tax incentives, you can be completely original in the ways you cobble your money together for, uh, for a film. Uh, I have to do a commercial for women in film. We just uh, closed out our scholarship for this year. For a feature film, we had $3,000 that nobody applied for, for a finishing grant. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a shame. And I've sent, I sent out tons of emails and to its, its members only. But nobody applied for it, so they lost three thousand dollars for that. Yeah, and I mean, and that can that can help pay for part of a composer, yeah. a little bit of editing, a little bit of whatever. Every little every little bit helps. Yeah. All right. So I know we're here for films, but do you have any expertise in like TV pilots? So TV pilots, I would say the thing with TV pilots nowadays is make a web series or make a proof of concept, put it online gain as much interest as you can for it because so much of television nowadays, uh, you'll see a lot of stuff that's based off of web series and people, people want to see something works before they want to take a, take a chance on it. It used to be you could go to NAPI, which is the National Association of Television Production Executives. Uh, they do it in Miami every year in January, uh, but frankly, I think it's a waste of time uh, anymore. You just, I, I haven't seen anything coming out of that since they used to do it back in Vegas in the early 2000s when you could actually go pitch a, pitch a TV series and sell it. I, I just don't see it that much anymore. It's, it's really now moved towards digital, create the, the web series, try and gain interest, build a huge following, and go from there. And I'll use another an example. There's a, a web series called Running With Violet, which is a Canadian web series, and they've actually shot a portion of it here locally. And they got you know, several hundred thousands of dollars in grants to make their web series. And now they've been able to build up an audience doing two seasons of it, and they're in negotiations to turn this into a series you know, with a Canadian company. So that's sort of the model when you talk about okay. television series, so essentially. Proof of concept, are you saying that you um, yeah, if you're talking about the first episode and you're going to do, say, you know, a 45-minute episode, I would instead break that 45-minute episode into, you know, 
10 four minute chunks. So now you've got a 10 episode web series that are four minute episodes a piece. That would be how I would, how I would break that down. I think you're better off doing a series and, and gaining interest in the series. People are more likely to watch something serialized like that than just a one-off okay. episode of something. Okay, thank you. I'm not texting on my um, <laughs> Animation films. Everything you talked about does or doesn't apply. I mean, anything in particular, animation, your star's face is not on the screen. Right. Any comments in that arena? Animation is expensive. Yeah, um, it's I, I, so I haven't been able successfully navigate animation film yet. Uh, it is expensive. It takes time, and it's there's you know you really don't know. It's hard to understand what this product's going to come out like. An in, in, independent space. The proof of concept is important. Something like that too. There's a local company, uh, Echo Bridge. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Echo Bridge. If you want to talk animation with anybody, those are the guys that will really be able to tell you everything about animation because they're you know they've created and worked on you know major animated television series and other projects. And I know they're working on trying to put together a feature. And this is an animation company, and they're having a hard time putting together a feature animated film. So you know, there you go. Any other questions? Well, great. Well, thank you guys so much for coming out thank today. Thank you. Hopefully we didn't bore you too much or get so into the weeds of <laughs> the financials that, uh, that you're totally confused. But yeah. we, we are recording this, obviously. So um, in a couple of weeks, we'll have this video done, and we'll throw this up on our YouTube channel as well. So any workshops like this that we do, we're always going to throw up on our YouTube channel. So feel free to go check that out to find more, more things like this. Will we also be able to get access to PowerPoint? Yes, yeah, shoot me an email, tony at filmspc.com, and I'll, uh, I'll email the PowerPoint over to you as well, just as a PDF. Great. All Thank right, you. thanks everybody. Thanks.